position. Uh, we have this beautiful passage that Carol just read for us. It's a passage that um, has a lot to say to us. One of the things I'd like to point out in the beginning is it's a good passage to remind us that Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time. All wrapped up in the same. Sometimes we read passages that will highlight one or the other for us and remind us of that theology of Jesus. Uh, this is one of those cases. Uh, Jesus, uh, just in a fun way, thinking about Jesus is trying to get uh, from one side of the sea to the other. And uh, so he's hitching a ride uh, with the disciples. And so just thinking about Jesus needing to get somewhere, needing a ride, um, in a fun way kind of shows uh, that he's human, um, along with being fully divine. Another way uh, that stresses his human side in this passage is that um, he needed a nap. Anybody in here tired? <laughs> Anybody appreciate a good nap? An uninterrupted good nap? Yes, yes. So we can relate to the human side of Jesus here. He's been working and traveling. And now he's preparing to go do some more work on the east side of the sea. He's going to a new land. Uh, he's going to do some miracles uh, with the Gentiles on the other side of the sea. And so he's catching a ride here with the disciples. He said, let's get in the boat and let's go. While they're at sea, um, and let's think about the water here uh, from their perspective. When we think of sea, when we think of the ocean, when we think of the Great Lakes, when we think of the bay, uh, many of us think of relaxation, right? And, uh, or sitting on the dock of the bay or fishing for recreation. Or hanging out, getting a suntan, reading a book, all those marvelous and wonderful things that we think about, especially when it's 60 degrees out and we start to dream of summer coming. Uh, well, that's not the case for these disciples and the first century uh, folks that lived uh, in the area there. The sea is terrifying. The sea is, are where, is where the demons live. The sea is where demons rise up out of the water and make the wind blow. The sea is where when there's an exorcism, uh, the demons go back into. The sea is where all sorts of chaos happens. The sea is where in the beginning of the Bible, in chapter 1, verse 1, the Spirit is hovering over that chaos. And where God has to break in and order it for us. As the creation takes place and takes shape, the sea is an ugly and terrifying place to be, even for these fishermen. It's so terrifying that the Bible ends with the stories of the new heaven and the new earth. It tells us that the sea will be no more. And one of the things that we can erase that and write in our own words. It's as if the Bible is saying chaos will be no more. Chaos will be no more. And so that is the setting of this miracle. That is the setting of this miracle. The passage was read for us. The disciples are in a boat. A storm, a gale force wind comes and water is coming in. They kind of get a little nervous, a little fearful, some anxiety sets in, and they call for Jesus. They pray out. They call out, wake up! Wake up, Jesus! Wake up! Now, here's where I also like to pause, and the scripture doesn't say this, but I like to have some fun with it and think about Jesus waking up here in the midst of this chaos and thinking, hey, I'm the carpenter. I built this boat. You're the fisherman. You're supposed to drive it. It's your fault that you got into this storm. Why are you waking me up? And you know how cranky you are when you wake up from a nap and you're not ready to wake up? I guarantee you that's going to happen to me today. 
I guarantee you, right now, in the church, in front of the cross, that we're going to ask Monica to watch the two little ones so we can take a nap. And it won't happen for very long. So pray for me. I'll pray for all. But you can hear a little bit, maybe, the tense of the situation and Jesus getting a little bit irritated with them, if, if Jesus could get irritated. Um, and the disciples, you can feel their anxiety. Wake up! The disciples call out. And then Jesus, just with a word, we gather from the other gospel stories, just with the word, be still, be still. And the storm is healed. And the anxiety and chaos of the moment um, is relieved. I picture a small boat, a fishing boat, a rowing type boat, with lots of people in it, and water crashing in, and so just chaos. Chaos. And they're relieved from that in a moment. This is a rare story, a rare opportunity for the disciples. Many times, and we're going to see this in the following passages as we move on, most of the time, the disciples are witnesses to the miracles or the work of Jesus being done on behalf of others. And so they see Jesus heal someone. They see Jesus uh, re um, resuscitate someone. They see Jesus exercise demons for somebody else. And so they're witnesses. This is a rare story where they experience a miracle on their own behalf, at their own prompting. Their own crying out, we need help. And Jesus answers that call and, and performs a miracle for the disciples. That is key for several reasons. Number one, they're going to be commissioned momentarily. It's coming up. They're going to be commissioned. They're going to be sent out two by two uh, to do work on their own. By the power of God in the name of Jesus. And so, in order to be effective, they have to experience some of that for themselves. That's number one. Number two, this story of Jesus healing in the midst of this chaos of calming the storm is going to sustain them over the long haul. They're going to get into some very tense, very chaotic moments. They're going to be tired. They're going to be overwhelmed. They're going to be presented with lots and lots of opportunity to call the name of Jesus. This story is going to sustain them through that. We'll pause just for a moment and think about the church. The church universal and the church us gathered here today um, is our usual position, our usual, usual posture to serve in the name of Jesus. Um, Fred McCraddock is a theologian um, that raises this point, and he says, that's our usual posture, to serve in the name of Christ. But every once in a while, we need to be the recipients of the presence of Jesus as well, as a church. We need to feel the power of God and keep the ones crying out, God, help us! Help us! So that, therefore, we can go out and help others. But help us. We have a need right now. We call on the name of Jesus. Wake up! Wake up, God! Wake up! And help us. Now, ironically, the psalmist tells us God never slumbers, right? But from our perspective, sometimes, just like the disciples, we think Jesus is sleeping on the job because our lives are so chaotic and we're so overwhelmed. But Christ is very important for us to remember that as a church. That every once in a while, we need that. Because again, that's going to sustain us over the long haul. If we're always just working on behalf of Jesus, pray for my neighbor, pray for my friend, uh, help me to be able to serve the poor and go visit you know, the imprisoned, help me with all that stuff so we can help the world, save the world, transform the world. If we're always in that mode, a lot of times it just simply wears us down. And again, just like the disciples are going to experience many times when we're doing ministry to the world, and 
And when it's time to call on the name of Jesus, it's in very chaotic situations. People generally don't need a miracle when things are calm and easy and when we're well rested. Amen? It's a very important part of the story. And so we call on Jesus to help us get it together and get it in order. And we need to have those experiences of the presence of Jesus in our own lives to help us as we go forth and serve. If we're tired and overwhelmed and living lives of chaos, we're no good to anybody else. When we lived in Charlestown, we had this house, and in the back there was an alley. And there was a row of houses behind that, a main road where cars would go up and down 55, 60, 65 miles per hour. But we had a little buffer, but we were close enough. We also had our little puppy, Theo, who just died recently, but he was our first baby. He was there, and Annika was probably five, Asher was probably three, and Marley was a newborn. And Theo, the dog, was always a runner, and if you opened the door of any in the house, he would run out and take off. He was the fastest little toy poodle you'd ever see. So one day I was home alone, like most of the time, with three kids, and six now. And I came around the corner and Asher was standing there naked, taking everything off. And his eyes were big and he was standing by the storm door with the other door open and I just knew he had let Theo out. I said, where's the dog? And he pointed out, of course. So I opened the door, called for him, no sign of Theo. And so I just knew he had run towards the main road. So I yell for Annika and take the naked boy and grab up the newborn baby like a football. And so I got the football in one arm and Asher's in the other and Annika's towing behind and we're yelling in the neighborhood, Theo! go over the alley and through the yards and we get out to the main road and about a you know a few hundred or a few hundred feet or whatever I see the little black dog poodle right by the main road and so I drop the baby or throw the baby and drop Asher and yell for Theo stop stop I go run I grab up Theo and I come back and I got the baby and Theo and the naked boy <laughs> and the yelling and screaming on I go, and then everything is turned now towards this little old lady. And she comes up to me and she says, Young man, it looks like you need to get your house in order. <laughs> and it took every ounce, every ounce, of the spirit that lived in me not to say something rude and hateful to this lady starting with thanks for the help lady <laughs> need to get your house in order and I gathered them up and we went back and we kept the chaos to ourselves inside the closed doors <laughs> But a lot of times, my life and your life gets chaotic. And she was right, out of order. And when it's chaotic, and it's out of order, and we're tired, and we're overwhelmed, for whatever the cause may be, kids or otherwise, we're no good to anybody. And we can't serve with all our heart, mind, and soul. And it's precisely then when we got to admit it that I can't do it. I've got to call on the great physician. And you call out, wake up, Jesus! Wake up, Jesus! And you call on Him. And you bring Jesus back into your life and His Spirit hovers over your chaos or my chaos and orders your life back in order. 
that you can take care of your own. And more importantly, be ready to go out into the world and serve in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Call on the great physician. That's my prayer for myself. And that's my prayer for all of you gathered here today. May God add his blessing to our word today. Thanks be to God. Thank you.